Uh, good afternoon, I'm Dave Safford uh, from GE. Monty Wiseman and I will be talking about a canonical event log structure for IMA. It's kind of interesting over the past uh, today and yesterday, I've heard lots of comments about attestation and I've heard it described as difficult, scary, and terrifying. <laughs> So perhaps I should retitle this as Adventures in Attestation. So what are we doing with, uh, with uh, this uh, attestation in, in uh, General Electric? So GE makes a lot of critical infrastructure. Um, transportation, renewables, power generation, something like 50% of the electricity in North America is generated on uh, GE gas turbines. Uh, gas and oil. Uh, energy storage, uh, aviation jet engines, and, and these are very, very large critical infrastructure businesses. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing, there's just been this very uh, large drive, a business need to connect these devices and these controllers, the embedded controllers for these, uh, into analytics um, type of, of systems because there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, money that can be made by optimizing these systems. So uh, we have controllers that run everything from $35 uh, devices all the way up to $35,000 flight control systems. And it's an imperative for us to combine the real-time control system that exists with um, analytics-capable uh, Edge OS, which are basically the Octo distribution of Linux, uh, running containers uh, to do the communication with the, with the cloud, to do sometimes local uh, optimization and analytics, because there's you know a tremendous amount of money to be made here. Some of the numbers at the bottom we've already been seeing with some of our applications: 10 percent, 5 percent, 3 percent savings, 17 percent cost down, uh, 1 percent in aviation. And, and these re represent tremendous amount of money. We're talking billions of dollars to be saved with, with this. So this all s sounds well and good until you start thinking about, you know, the security aspects of this. I mean, um, so Mike was saying that, you know, attestation terrifies him. What terrifies me is that currently I don't know what software is running on these controllers that are running these critical infrastructures. So attestation is a, you know, critical piece of our uh, security architecture to be able to answer that question. Do we know what's running on these systems is still what we intend it to be or, or has it been compromised? And attestation is the one that can really produce this. This has been part of a, a multi-year effort that we've been, been doing to, to create the entire security uh, tra uh, chain of trust working all the way from the hardware and that's CPU selections, the boards, putting TPMs on the boards, uh, firmware, we talked about all the different secure boots. We're looking at all aspects of secure boot, protected boot to, to protect the actual flash, um, verified boot, measured boot, and DRTM, dynamic, dynamic route of trust for measurement. We think all of these play an, an important part in the architecture. The operating system, um, integrity measurement architecture to collect measurements and signatures such that we can actually do the attestation. And then, so we've been working on this, and this year, we finally got all of the lower layers done, and now we've moved up to the attestation layer, and that's been our primary thrust of work this year. And some of the issues that we're, we're coming up with are things that we would like to enhance in attestation, uh, three main areas. First thing is scalability. We've had some of the issues in some of our very small and, and surprisingly even in some of our very large controllers where uh, the measurement list being kernel memory resident, you know, essentially a, a, over long-term operation being a, a, you know, effectively a kernel memory leak um, can actually cause problems. And so we're looking at some ideas for moving these measurement lists out of the kernel into user space and managing them there. And, and in some sense, there's really not a need to keep them in the kernel. The data itself is protected because it's anchored in PCR uh, in the TPM. So regardless of where it's stored, we can, can uh, authenticate it, validate it in, in a strong way. And so that's one of our issues. Second issue is completeness. If you think about the, the chart of, of what's currently there, uh, IMA can do local appraisal of data in a file. 
It can also do remote attestation of data in the file. EVM is about local protection of the metadata of the file. And so what we'd like to do is extend this to include remote attestation of metadata. So with our current thing, if we have remote attestation says the data of the file is correct, well, that's good. But we also need to know, is the security label on it still correct? Is the mode still correct? Has somebody made it set UID root? Has, you know, these other sorts of things we need to have as part of our attestation. The third aspect uh, is standards compliance. It's one of the big issues on actually fielding, you know, taking on, on this massive task of fielding client and server uh, attestation systems is it gets really hard if everybody's doing things a little bit differently. So standardization is a, a very important part of that. And Monty's been leading the TCG standardization effort there. And so between the two of us, we're trying to uh, um, actually have a common design uh, based on what's called TLV or type length value uh, uh, triples. And I've been actually doing a proof of concept of that on top of uh, IMA to show that, you know, um, to t actually test the design, make sure that it's, it's something that's feasible and, and, and usable. Uh, some additional bonus things that we're throw looking at here. Sequence numbers for all events, so that we can synchronize it wherever the data goes, from kernel to user space to the attestation server. Timestamps, and this is the timestamp not on the file, but this is a timestamp on when did we actually measure um, the file, when did we verify it, you know, was it today or was it a year ago. Uh, flexible dynamic uh, selection of included fields um, and some other benefits that if we actually move the measurement list out of the kernel that actually makes some of the other operations like k exec easier. So this kind of gives an overview of, of some of the different things that we're looking at in this proof of concept work. Um, this is very much an RFC right now. It's both a, a, a standard that's in development, it's not final. Uh, the code is very early code, uh, and, and so there's a very good time if you can, can uh, interact and give us comments and feedback as where, where you'd like to see it go. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Monty to talk about the standardization effort. Thank you. I, I want to reiterate uh, somewhat we lost the disclaimer that um, this is a draft specification. I've been given approval by TCG to present it um, because it's still a work in progress. But we think after several months of kind of boiling this down, this is the format that we, we would like to, to go with. And as David said, we had a bit of a real problem because today we have PC measurements, PC client measurements, or server measurements of firmware, but we also have measurements from IMA we want to be able to convey these out to uh, a verifier. Um, if you think about it, what's the point of all this attestation? If you just don't do anything with it, it goes to a verifier, and the verifier wants to look at it, compare it against all the measurements, for example, and make, make some sort of trust decision. So we started looking at this and thinking, well, we've got these PC client. They were defined back in 2001. Those structures, we have IMA structures. How do we encapsulate all of that? Right, so what, so what we've done here is we've created, uh, basically the way to describe it is, kind of an encapsulation. And one would be able to put different sets of things in here, as I'll describe <coughs> in, in just a second. So the overall format here is, you're seeing is there's four fields inside of each record. And each field itself is a TLD. So you, we are starting off with a record number. And, and this solves a, a, the, the problem that, that David articulated with, you know, if you go pull the stuff out of, uh, of IMA, for example, how do you know what sequence? The sequence is incredibly important because that's how you verify it in PCR10. The same applies for the PC client. How the PC client works is if you, if you ever looked at the PC client spec and how it, uh, how it cr keeps track of the measurements, the requirement is they're simply sequential in memory. And that's how you, that, that's how we maintain them because nobody wanted to consume the extra space to put a sequence number in it because the assumption is when you go get it out, they are by definition or by the requirement in sequence. But when you go sticking this thing on a wire, for example, you start sticking this thing in a database, you're really going to want a record number. The other reason for the record number is you might, maybe this, the server's connected for a little while and then it connects and you want to ship off, you know, 
10,000 records or whatever it is, you want to know where to start you, when, when it goes, gets reconnected again. You want to be able to put all of these pieces back together again. So we decided the very first thing we wanted to add into this wrapper, um, the, the, kind of this wrapper thing is, is, is a record number. Um, and so, again, within each one of these fields is a, um, uh, a tag. And right now, my position right now is this is a, an octet, an eight bits, because we're gonna try to be very, very stingy about how we allocate these things. And I'll describe that I think there's a very, very few of them that we need to create. Followed by a length, obviously, and then followed by a value, right? In this case, the record number would simply be a uint of um, the, the, the sequence number. The second field is the PCR they got measured into, right? And one would argue that this is kind of a little overkill, there aren't too many PCRs, but we wanted to keep the TLV across all fields consistent. I mean, we really could have just put a UN32 in there. But what we wanted to do, and we debated it back and forth, is we wanted to make the parsers, we wanted to make it very consistent for the parsers as they're walking through this. So every one of these fields is a TLV even though you technically don't need it to be that way for a PCR, there's not that many of them, not even that many possible in the TCG spec. But it's a TLV regardless. Followed by a digest, and I've got another slide that'll walk through exactly how the digest works and followed by the actual event content. So what we will do, we being TCG at this point, we will define this layer as architectural TCG, will define this layer of tags uh, for each one of these fields, and that's going to be the distinction between TCG architectural defined, as I just arbitrarily call it down here, CEL for canonical event log. Uh, TCG will, will, will define what those are. And so this is a breakdown of them for right now. We decided to start with zero because everything starts with zero anyway, but it's also really convenient that every record starts with the value zero. So you'd be able to actually, if you're debugging this, it might be easy to go f distinguish between the records. And then we'll allocate a tag of one for PCR, um, two for this field is the TCG digest, and I'll get into why I put TCG digest in front of that. And then three on to the end will be defining content type. And in the table below, I'm describing some of the content types. One is context management. I'll get into that in a, in, in a later slide. But four and five, for example, will encapsulate the firmware so the, the stuff that comes out of the PC client spec or comes out of the firmware PCR, um, TCG, uh, PCR event two structure, for example, that's where the content would be. So I've defined two different types. I don't have slides on those because um, we want to have save time to focus on IMA right now. And then I've allocated um, six for IMA and, and these numbers are kind of just made up numbers for now because the spec's still in trans, um, still in development. but. Uh, a content type for IMA legacy, which is the IMA we all know and love today. And then we're proposing, and David's got some code, for a new format for IMA, which we're calling IMA TLV. So each one of these would describe, just go back for a second, each one of these would describe the event content on the very, very right-hand side. <clears throat> so let me get into how the digest works. Now, I don't know if anyone's familiar, but the TPM2 is at what's called algorithm agile. So you don't just have it, a single bank of PCRs. PCRs are actually a uh, two-dimensional array, if you will. So every PCR number can actually be associated with multiple SHA or uh, hash types. So PCR1 might have a SHA1 um, bank, and it might also have a SHA256 bank. It might have a SHA-3 bank. It might even have a SHA or an, an SM-3 bank, which is um, we've allocated one for the, uh, the Chinese set of algorithms. So when you address any PCR, depending on how the BIOS, the, the owner of the machine, has provisioned the machine, you might likely have one or more banks of PCRs associated with one particular PCR index. All right. So what we've done is we've accommodated that inside here, because what, what, what you do when you create a, an extend operation in, in TPM2, you will actually hand it a hash value for each one of the banks that you want to extend. So we're reflecting that here inside the digest field. So there's a TCG digest saying, okay, this contains an array of digests, and there's a length of the whole thing. 
And you would, uh, so if your P TPM was allocated with two banks, SHA-1 and SHA-256, you would put a SHA-1 hash in there and a SHA-256. The digest ID is the digest ID, uh, and, th and this is the reason I call it TCG digest, is these digest IDs are taken from the TCG algorithm ID. So if you go, go download the algorithm ID, it has a bunch of enumerated values identifying SHA-1, SHA-256, SM3, for example. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, lastly, then, is the content type. We will, again, TCG will define this high-level content type, and right now we've got a, a couple that I enumerated before, but the important thing to, to say is once, once you're inside the V portion, the data portion of this content type, how it's defined inside that is entirely up to the content owner. For example, the PC client ones, I'm actually giving over the two PC client ones I've allocated, I'm giving over to the PC client group and says, you guys define how you want your event log to be transported inside this. And for, I, I, we've got one set up for I'm a legacy, which I'll describe, and I'm a TLD. Those will define exactly how the, their set of data and their um, uh, algorithms uh, will be expressed inside this content type. There's a minor typo. I had 80 through 8F, and that's when I thought I'd set the upper bid, but <clears throat> that was actually intended to be uh, uh, 03 through FF. And, and so kind of to wrap this up, in, in the ideal world with new sets of content type going forward, all you would really do when you want to create the value that's going to be extended into the TPM is you would simply hash the entire content field and then you would put that into, you know, you, you would extend that into the TPM. I think this slides up now. So what you would do is you would stick that into the V value and then you would extend that, that exact same value into the TPM. So the value in this V is the exact same value that you, you pass to the TPM extend operation itself. <clears throat> so let me touch on a couple of the CEL management David talked about a little bit. We thought there might be some pretty interesting things. Unfortunately, we lost some of the bullets, so this is actually a little, maybe a little difficult to read. But we thought it would be interesting to, or a good idea to provide maybe some metadata around the event log itself. For example, um, as David mentioned, a timestamp. So you got a bunch of events that happened in IMA, for example, or maybe the transition between the firmware and the first time of measurement, you might want to know exactly what time that is, what time that happened. So you'd be able to put a timestamp CEO management event right, right at that particular point. Um, so, and there's other concepts of like EV separators and, um, and, and we're deciding, we think all of them are security sensitive, but there might be some that are informative. Um, for example, what version number, and I'll, actually I think it's on the next slide, I give kind of an example of you know, what the stream of these TLVs would look like. One of the things would be, I think it's a good idea to first send off, maybe there's a version associated, we've, we've revved this. So we, we create a management type that simply says, this is the version of the spec, this particular, the stream, this, this machine is built to. So we'd probably start with something like that. Then there would be obviously an array of PC client measurements that came out of the firmware before the OS even started. Then you might have something like an EV separator. Okay, the firmware is ending at this point. We are now starting with the set of IMA event logs. And then I thought, well, we probably need something for systems that go into sleep or hibernate, right? These things go into a suspended state and they actually somewhat change the security properties. It would be a good idea to have a, a measurement of as the machine's going into sleep or coming out of sleep, that we would be able to log that as well. So these are an example of the kind of things we can do with the, um, with the measurement. <clears throat> so let me just walk through the workflow a little bit. And the workflow, really starting from the bottom, let's start, start from the bottom, is obviously that we, we don't want any, because you know, the first thing when I uh, kind of shop this around the rest of the TCG uh, working group, all of the, the, the PCOAM vendors panicked, you're going to make me change my firmware. No, we're not going to make you change your firmware. So what we're going to do is, obviously, they've got their TCG PCR event structure. Don't change it. There's going to be a utility, and I'm going to work on that, actually, 
utility to convert it into this new format when it needs to be transported off the machine. So we would be able to map the existing stuff into this new canonical event format. The same thing uh, going up one more level, if you've got the existing IMA, you might not want to change your server, but you do need to transport this information. You want it to go to a, a verifier that understands this, so we would write a utility for that. If you were to have a new module, like David's going to talk about in a few minutes, where the kernel itself produces these TOB records, there would be no translation at all. It would just, trans it would just transfer directly. So let me show you an example of um, our, our proposal for a new way to represent um, uh, IMA integrity measurements that, that's very expandable. All right, so we would, um, you know, basically inside this content, you can actually have an array of TOVs representing that particular module. It might be mod, might be path, might be the actual hash of the hash of the data, wh whatever, you know, actually David, kinda, David and Mimi will, will actually end up owning this and defining these sort, uh, you know, what, what sort of thing go, goes in here. And, and you can actually have an array of these things. And so, even, and, and even within them, I, we've architected in the ability to be hash agile within the uh, IMS structure itself. So for example, if you wanted to at the same time create a SHA-1 hash of a file because the server you're gonna send this information to wants SHA-1 because it's a legacy. And at the same time you produce a SHA-256, you'd be able to just simply append these just like up in the digest field, right? And then you, this would just be part of that, that content type record. And then what you would do when you get done with all of your measurement of the, of, of the file, of the data, whatever you're, you're doing is you would hash these and what I'm depicting here is the actual structure that's sent into the TPM. It's called a TPML digest value. You would create a, for example, a hash one. This would be the example of a SHA-1, or hash two, and that would be the example of SHA-256. You would put those in there and do the extend operation, and then you would simply copy them up into this digest field, and now the whole record would be complete. So that was actually a lot before I go on to the example of legacy IMA, do I have any questions? Or did I completely lose everybody? Um, okay, so for example, IMA, how do we deal with IMA legacy? So we decided to, uh, as an experiment, and I would, uh, again, it's a utility that I, I, I would like to write is, you know, you've got these templates that are depicted on, on the left-hand side how do we, you know, how do we represent that? So again, on the right side, there's a concept of, you know, I'm a tag content, uh, L, and then uh, tag value, and I've got these various templates. And so this would be an example of what we would do. And this is an exception to when I said you would hash the entire content because the current I'm a doesn't have that concept today. So what we would do is simply take the, uh, if you're doing the uh, template D, for example, uh, what you would do is simply take a hash of the file content, make a TOV record out of that. You would put the, the fact that this is, I'm sorry, it's a time, uh, it's an IMA template. And so that would be identified here. The, the D field represents the hash of the file content. The N represents the, ha um, the actual the file name, the string of the file name and what IMA Legacy does is you concatenate those and hash them and then take that and extend it. So in this case, you would hash these two together just like IMA does today, put that into the V field and then you would, I think I have a slide, no, that's the end. I, then at that point you would extend that into the TPM uh, or that was extended in the TPM because it, it had already happened, that's why I have a slide on it. So this is how you would write this utility <coughs> is you would have to, as you read the security FS, uh, I'm a security FS, and read this information, this is how you would translate that. So that on the other end, someone would be able to use this standard format, be able to redo the calculations and they would just match. So anyway, any questions on the overall? So the actual deck is about 45 slides. <laughs> So that was a pre that was a that was a summary.
Okay, I think that was right, just right timing. So David has some real life examples here. I think he had one question for you. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <clears throat> so are you worrying about how to export this across uh, machine boundaries where you have to worry about encoding issues such as byte order, et cetera, or is that handled somewhere else by yeah. some other layer? Yeah, so that's gonna be handled. Um, I've, got, I've got a colleague who's actually working on a CBOR implementation. So we're gonna be, that, that's the next phase is starting to think about those kind of representation as it leaves the machine. Obviously, you know, D David's got this nice little ASCII, ASCII dump, but that's not what we're gonna send. We're actually gonna transport this on top of a, uh, a new protocol that's being developed by TCG called PTS, Platform Trust Services. So we're gonna transport this on top of that, and I expect that, you know, like I said, my colleagues working on CBOR today, but we expect a JSON, a CBOR. This is as much a data representation as it is an information model. So you could take this information model and map it to lots of other sorts of formats to transport. Yeah, thanks. Questions? Okay. So for, um it's all well and good to have slides and a nice design, but the proof of the pudding is actually writing code and seeing if it actually works. So we do, uh, we've done a proof of concept of this. Um, and uh, three, three aspects of it. The first thing was um, while most of the template code was nicely isolated into I'm a template and I'm a template lib, there was some aspect of template throughout some of the other files. And, and so the first thing was basically just doing a refactoring to get all of the template things into an additional I'm a FS template, I'm a Q template, uh, and pulling off a separate uh, I'm a template.h, just not changing any functionality, just you know refactoring it. The second part then was to write the TLV code. And the current uh, proof of concept code, uh, I think demonstrates nicely how simple this can be when you do everything in TLV. The total code is, is 480 lines of code compared to the 1,700 lines of code in the existing template uh, code and a total about 4,000 lines of code in the basic uh, part of IMA. So it actually it becomes very, very simple to do this and it's kind of compelling. Uh, the way it currently is, I'm do it, done it in the proof of concept, is that it's a kconfig option that you can select I'm a measurement list format either template or TLV, and I've done regression tests against the, the original template version to make sure you didn't break anything, uh, and, and then separately been testing the TLV. Um, one of the things on how easy it is to add a field, uh, basically it's only a few lines of code to add a new field. You define a content type. Um, once you have a content type, you have some code that figures out how long that field is gonna be. You then have another couple lines of code that can actually fill in that field, and that's it. All the rest, of the, the infrastructure handles it for you. And there's a helper functions like I'm a TLV buff that actually does the serialization and handles endianness. Uh, back to the endianness question, we're following uh, for the IMA part of this, the IMA content, we're doing you know, the canonical format for IMA, which is a little endian, and everything is converted. And I haven't had actually a chance to test this on a big Indian machine, but hopefully the code would actually work correctly and produce the, the canonical format. So what does this look like actually running? So the first thing is that the existing binary uh, runtime measurement and ASCII runtime measurements are persistent data. You can keep doing them. In this model, when you cat the uh, syskernel security IMA TLV runtime measurements, it actually reads the data out one time and deletes it out of the kernel so that we you know, uh, eliminate this, uh, the memory uh, leak issue. And so what you do then is you have, um, essentially your utility is gonna take it and save it somewhere. Uh, and this can be as simple as just cat and, and redirect it to a file like bin data. Then you can take that binary data and run programs on it to do the attestation or to do analysis locally. Uh, now that you've preserved the data up in user space. And this shows an example in which they're doing just two fields. 
uh, and this is an ASCII dump of the binary, but what actually gets transported is a binary. So you have a sequence number. Uh, this was the 1364th entry, PCR number 10, TCG digest, which in this case is a SHA-1. There's the SHA-1, and that's the digest of the entire record. The record includes path, uh, and so I actually had run the TLV dump pro program. The data hash for the file is a SHA-256, which is that value. The dump program also does verification on the list. In this case, it says the digest matches the content, which is good. So that means that this record has not been, this particular record has not been tampered with. And after all the records are analyzed and it has been keeping track of what the PCR 10 value should be after all of the extends. And so it says the final PCR value should be this. And in fact, if you do the TPM2 PCR list, you can see that that actually comes up with you know, the valid answer. So we've been through, um, you know, two different things, one side creating the data and another side analyzing it. Uh, it would have been better if two different people did that to actually stress test the implementation. Um, but uh, at least uh, we've gotten to, the, to this, uh, this level of testing of it. So before I go into a summary, let me actually show this running. So this is actually running on my laptop here and I've been doing kernel compiles on it and it hasn't panicked in at least three days. So. Uh, the code must be ready to ship. Um, <laughs> so here, here's the example of taking, reading what new thing measurements are in the measurement list and redirecting them up to a file. Here's running the TLV dump program on that. I'm just going to look at the last two things. This actually shows some of the extended fields. So again, we have sequence number, PCR number, digest for the record the data hash for the file, I and mean the file name, owner, and now this is showing some of the metadata fields that we're testing to now. So this is owners is zero, group is zero, and mode, well look at this, this actually turns out to be a, a set UID program. So this is some of the sorts of things you can see remotely now and get visibility into what's running on your system. So it's not just the data, it's now metadata about it. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't show an example of, the, of including the SE Linux label, but that would obviously be the next fun thing that we could show there. And the digest matches the content. And so drum roll, please, let's see if this actually worked. So if we go back and look, hey, whew, okay, I get, to, I get paid. Um, PCR 10 should be 8A through EB. And that is, in fact, what we see here. So the measurement list has not been tampered with, um, and uh, each of the entries are valid, and the, and the list is valid. That's basically what happens in the attestation, except we add the additional step that the TPM signs this value, and it's a challenge response signature from the attestation server to, to prove freshness and then it gets the list and, and validates this. But that's showing the basic functionality. So at least from a proof of concept, I go back to my summary slide. So this demonstrates at least a proof of concept level of being able to pull the, the measurement list out of the kernel. It shows a proof of concept of being able to attest to, to the metadata uh, on the file. It shows how relatively simple it is to write and to parse the measurement list. Uh, and it demonstrates that we've actually done a validation of the draft standard uh, so that's actually doing a sanity check on, on the standard itself. And so at this point, like I say, this is all draft. It's all proof of concept level, uh, which is a perfect time then, you know, to get some feedback on this. Uh, and we have lots of questions. You know, feel free to kind of, you know, um, give suggestions and, and comments and all the rest. But uh, one of the questions is, um, in the current code, it's either template or TLV. You know, so you can compile the kernel to be backwards, you know, com compatible for user space, or you can select TLV. Is there a case, a use case where we might need both? I can't think of one, you know, so I didn't implement it, but maybe that's something somebody can think of a use case. Uh, the other th memory leak that I, I took out was the in-kernel in hash table, and Mimi already warned me that I shouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> but th I, the question is, if we have all the data outside, we can certainly regenerate a hash table in user space. Is there a need for in-kernel 
hash table like it's had before. If there is, I mean, it's not hard to add it, but we're trying this as a proof of concept to see, you know, would it work if we did not have the hash table. Um, uh, long term, is that something that, in fact, we want to move forward and deprecate uh, the existing template code? One of the convenient things is that with TLV is it's actually pretty easy uh, to be, to have, you know, forward compatibilities, these things change because even if you're not exactly in sync with the version of the sender and receiver, the fact that everything's TLV formatted means we can still parse it and we may not understand all of the fields, but we can still parse it and, and, and handle the fields that we do understand on both sides. So it makes it easy to, to, to do upgrades. Other fields, are there other aspects of data or metadata that would be interesting to include that we could, you know, uh, consider adding. Uh, any, and any other comments or suggestions on this? Um, there's still a lot of work, obviously, to do on this in the standards committee. Um, there's obviously a lot of work to do if we actually, you know, want to upstream this, refactor it, clean it up, uh, incorporate any suggestions you have, and work with the community to do that. Uh, so. You know, feel free to, to give us feedback on this. With that, questions? I think we stunned them into really silence. Really, really bad or really good? <laughs> so, timestamps. Um, I'm sure there are situations where you can get decent enough time um, to be sure of timestamps. But I'm sure there are also situations where you can't. Um, putting it in as an option means that people use it in places they absolutely shouldn't, um, which is always a danger. And also there's the problem of, you know, if you're taking from multiple systems and doing the remote stuff, you need to have ways of, of managing that. Um, just a comment to that, really. I mean, obviously having the numbering it so that you can, makes a lot of sense. But... Just be wary of the timestamping. I think absolutely. I mean, so our kind of use case for timestamps is we have, you know, we have an embedded controller that's been running for a year, right? You know, so and and, and the convenient thing is to take the timestamp, you know, that's there. What we're actually taking is just the seconds, you know, from the epochs, and even that's like you say, probably ridiculously precise, uh, considering what we have. But it seems like a reasonable. The, thing to do. The, the TBM actually has a time capability, and so in theory, we haven't worked. Literally, it's just a placeholder timestamp. Work to be done here, but one of the ways I thought about is using the TPM's capability of creating a timestamp and putting that in the record. Right. So among the options, I think that's one of them. Uh oh. <laughs> Is it time to run and hide? <laughs> Ducking behind the. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, yes. Okay, so you're taking, you're getting rid of the measurement list, and let's say that we're in the case of K exec. The question is, you're k execing something, and let's say that you're, n you're not doing appraisal, you're just doing measurement. How are you going to know that you didn't k exec something and that that measurement wasn't included, that the next boot isn't, is actually doing measurements? There are, that kernel might not have a policy to do measurements. So you've now introduced a vulnerability of that you were you booted something and it's not going to show up in the measurement list and there's no and there's no way of showing it in the the TPM won't be extended because it's not being it's not included in the policy so I, I think there there are a couple different issues are the first thing is that admittedly we're pushing the complexity of handling k exec up into user space, but I think that's really, in some sense, the right place to do it. What k exec as the application would need to do is make sure that it has flushed all measurements out of the existing uh, thing before it actually triggers a k exec. As long as it does that, then there 
are no measurements to be lost, the new um, system comes up and starts measurements from that perspective. So there should not be anything in there um, that was committed to the TPM that was not already exported to, to the existing list before the K-Exec. But there's nothing there that's going to show that you did a K-Exec. Why, why wouldn't we measure a K-Exec event? The K, that the next, that there might be a gap because you might have multiple KEGs. Well, we, we certainly will get the measurement of KEGSEC itself and anything that would be triggered by that. But it's a good point. I mean, we do need to look at that. And, and in, in essence, we're pushing that complexity up into user space. But I like taking complexity out of the kernel and putting it up into user space. <laughs> Thank you.